Well, good evening and welcome to the uh, kickoff of a new series. This series is going to be so fun. You got maps, you got archaeology, you got pictures. That alone, that alone guarantees this will be good. Uh, but in all seriousness, I'd like to highlight not everything in this series will be recent, but I do want you, but a lot will be. And what we're going to talk about in this first lesson is very recent. And I want you to kind of just come away with the idea that we continue to dig up things that validate the Bible. It's not just used to do it, it's still going on. And uh, I think you'll find some of these uh, fascinating. So let me say a prayer for us and we'll jump right in. Lord, we are so grateful to be able to gather here today. And I pray, Lord, for all that are here in the, in the, within the sound of my voice, I pray for your comfort for those who are struggling, I pray, Father, for your presence, uh, for anxious times, for mourning, for healing. Lord, we need you, and I pray that we would walk with you every day. I pray for our nation, Lord, that your hand would be on it. I pray that you would guide us. I pray that you would turn the hearts of our leaders toward you. Father, we know that you are sovereign in all the events of the world, and I pray, Father, that in the end, all will glorify your name. In Christ's name, amen. Well, here's our number for questions, so feel free to text questions. Uh, as always, we kind of have an unspoken agreement. You can ask any question you want, and if I don't know the answer, I will make it up. I feel like that's a reasonable <laughs> agreement. You ask anything you want, I'll make up the answer if I don't know, and we'll both be happy. So this, uh, I want to talk about a specific archeological find in this lesson. Some of the lessons will be a series of finds that make a point about the scriptures. This is a find that's very recent in archeological terms. It's this century. Uh, it's, it's not well known yet, but it's going to be very well known. This is probably in my view, one of the most significant finds for the Christian faith in as long as I can remember. This is a hugely significant find. So first, I'd like to orient us with answering the question, when are we going back to, where are we going, and what are we actually going to look at? So let's start with, this is a list of Roman emperors from just a, a certain period of time. So for example, we begin with Augustus here, and as you know, he ruled from 27 BC to 14 AD. He was the Roman emperor at the birth of Jesus. Then uh, Nero, who ruled during the time of, he's the one who put Paul and Peter to death in about 68 AD. He's the one that burned Rome, blamed the Christians, and there began some persecution. So this was one of the early persecutions by the Romans. A significant persecution by the Romans fired up at the end of the first century. Think 96, 81 to 96, and this is Domitian. So think the Apostle John being imprisoned on the island of Patmos for preaching. Roman persecution really kicked into gear during this time. And Roman persecution, broadly speaking, of Christianity continued in higher or lower severity for the next 200 years. During the rule of Diocletian, 284 to 305, that's him, there was a particularly brutal persecution of Christians. One fact I want to point out, because this will be really useful later, but in 303 AD, he declared that it was illegal for Christians to be in the Roman army. It's very interesting, why would you need to say that? Because there were a lot of Christians in the Roman army, and you're gonna see some evidence of that today. Then Constantine, becomes emperor 306 to 337, and this is Constantine. Constantine, you probably know the story about him having the vision of putting the cross on their shields and getting victory, and there's a lot of argument about whether Constantine actually became a Christian emperor or he was just favorable to the Christians. 
Either way, for our story, in about 313 AD, he issues, he, un, he reverses Roman policy for the past 200 years and says, it's fine to be Christian. And in not too long a time, it's actually very favorable to be Christian. He presided over the Council of Nicaea, where Christians came together to settle some issues in 325 AD. So in that time period, very quickly, you see that Christianity goes from being outlawed to being favorably looked upon. This is one reason, this is kind of a side comment, there are a lot of the churches, a lot of the cathedrals, a lot of the Christian uh, things that you see come from and start in the fourth century AD. That's why they come from the fourth century AD into the 300s, because then you could build a church out in the open. Before Constantine, you really couldn't build a church out in the open. That was called helping the police know where to find you. You know, so people didn't do it. So a lot of times you're gonna see, well, this is from the fourth century, that's from the fourth century. And uh, documents, uh, when we get into looking at some of the earliest Christian copies of the Bible, you're gonna see a lot of fourth century. One of the reasons is, is because you could do it in the open. It wasn't surreptitious. So just so you know, the timing of this is such that in the fourth century it became okay to be a Christian. But I wanna situate you here, and I cannot guarantee you that Severus Alexander was the emperor at the time of what I'm gonna show you. But think Severus Alexander, think Maximinus here. I wanna go back to about 230 AD. So we're still 80 years before it's legal to be a Christian. So I wanna go back into the middle of the empire. Now some of these uh, emperors were more aggressive about persecuting Christians. Some areas of the empire were more aggressive about persecuting Christians. And there were occasionally times when there was sort of an uneasy, nobody's coming after us kind of a thing. It was never legal, but there were more or less uh, persecution. So we wanna go back to 230 AD. This is very early in the church. It's a time when you don't see much coming out of the church because it wasn't legal to meet. People were meeting in house churches and they were kind of underground. So that's when we're going to. Now, where are we going to? This is a map of uh, Israel. This is uh, the, a valley, and this is a very famous valley. This is the Jezreel Valley, right through here. And on the, one of the uh, cities on the corner is Megiddo. Megiddo, uh, if you've ever been to that tell of Megiddo or the, the, the little hill of Megiddo, it has 34 layers of civilization. There have been cities and outposts there for a long, long time back into history. But one of the reasons is it's a great place to guard the entrance into this land because armies are gonna march through this valley. The other thing you may know about Megiddo is that it is from Armageddon is the hill of Megiddo. And so if you think geographically, many people think that the battle of Armageddon in the book of Revelation will actually literally happen here in the valley of Jezreel where so many battles have happened. I'm talking battles in World War I, battles before the Israelites even got there. This has been a place for battles for a long time. But very near here is a little village, and I'm just gonna call this place Legio, which is its Latin name, but very close to that, I mean, you can see it from Megiddo, is a, a town, a, a village, but there's an excavation of a place called Legio, very near this area. What has been excavated there? So there have been two things excavated there. One is a Roman army camp. This is a, obviously an artist's portrayal. And so their excavation of a Roman army camp. A Roman army camp was in a square. It was laid out very neatly and usually had, just like this artist has portrayed it at the top of the picture, a huge embankment around it for 
to be protected. And then this is the nearby village uh, in the bottom portion of this. Because of the finds here, you realize that this is the location of the sixth Roman legion called Ferrata. Ferrata means ironclad. So the sixth legion, the ironclad legion, they have a long history of battles. We actually know from other records where they were stationed. The entire legion, which would be about 5,200 men, was not stationed in this camp, but a portion of the legion. The legion would have been in several camps in the area to protect the land from invasion, to pacify the land. In other words, there was a Roman presence there. And so this is the Roman Sixth Legion. That, uh, what you see there that has the beginning, L-E-G-V, is a roof tile. And so they were made of clay and they would stamp the roof tiles. And so all the roof tiles are Sixth Legion. Uh, they had bread stamps that have been found there, where when you would bake bread, it was kind of like an advertisement. You would stamp the dough and it would, you know, obviously you bake it and there's some words there. And so you see bread tiles um, in the top you see some Roman, little pieces of Roman armor. They would take these little pieces and sew them together and it would be sort of like a chain mail type thing to protect you from a sword, uh, sword thrust. And so this dates from right at 230 AD into the Christian era when Christianity is being persecuted. We have seen this for a long time. We've been going to Israel for a dozen years or so. And every time we're in Megiddo, we look over and we can see this village. And I'll tell you, show you why you can see this village in a minute. And we knew there was an excavation over there, but we didn't know what they'd found and what they were doing. And tonight you'll find out what they found there and it's pretty significant. Our attention is not really focused on the Roman camp, our attention is focused on this building right here at the edge of the village. And this, villi th this building has been excavated. And I wanna focus on this building and I wanna show you an artist's rendition of this building. This is clearly, and I'm gonna show you this mosaic floor. This building is clearly a Christian worship space. It is the oldest ever found Christian worship space. Why might that be? I mean, there were worship spaces in the first century, but why might this be the oldest that's found because it's hard to find Christian worship spaces when Christianity was illegal. So 230 AD is the oldest known that has been found Christian worship space. And that's what I wanna look at. This is called the Megiddo Mosaic. A mosaic is, let me show you what it looks like. This is the bottom of that building. Obviously the building's not there. A mosaic, if you remember, is an artistic thing. They would put down some uh, plaster basically, and then you'd have these small little tiles, and you put the tiles in, and everything you see there is made of little tiles. And uh, that, that's what a mosaic is. And sometimes there were mosaics on the wall. This is a mosaic floor. You can see there the mosaic floor is being cleaned and what you see here is the pedestal that had that table on it. So first, uh, I just wanted to show you some pictures so you get an idea of how big it is. It's not a huge room, but it's a pretty good sized space, obviously. And by having the people in the picture, you can kind of get an idea. Notice the designs. And uh, not only are those designs interesting for what's there, they're interesting for what's not there. There are not a lot of uh, human depictions, still in keeping with the Jewish idea of no idols. There are no pagan symbols there. There are no Roman gods there. I mean, when you look at mosaics that are not Christian, obviously, you will see any number of, of things, gods and goddesses, etc. But it's fairly plain in that sense. But let's look at what is there. And I wanna look at every single piece of this because it's unbelievably important. First, because it's the oldest Christian worship space found. Second, right in the middle is this medallion and in it are two fish. And as you probably know, fish are a symbol of Christianity. If you've ever driven down the road and wondered why is there a fish on the back of that car? 
It's, a, it's an early symbol of Christianity, and it's kind of a secret symbol. And why is the fish a symbol of Christianity? In Greek, the word fish in the Greek language is an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior. It's an acronym, so if you, it's ichthus. So if you just take those Greek letters, they stand they, for Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior, but it means fish. And so fish became kind of a inside symbol like, ah, Christian, that's a secret code, so to speak, for a Christian. Make sense? So when you see fish, you think, well, that could easily be Christian. And so that's interesting that it's there, but not surprising that it's there. What surprised me is this, what kind of fish are they? This is important to Oklahomans. There's, there's a tuna and a bass. And that just tells you bass fishing and Christianity have gone together for 1800 years. So I just wanna validate that, that bass fishing is a spiritual pursuit, all right? So you see the, the Christian symbol uh, near the middle, and now I wanna give you a shot from above. So this is the floor, and I wanna look at pieces of this because everything in here is really interesting. I wanna look at the inscriptions. You will see in, these inscriptions are in Greek. There's an inscription there. There's a long one here. There's an inscription in Greek here. And then I want to look at this, basically where an altar would be normally. So I wanna look at those four aspects, and this is a view of a, a good sized room and this mosaic floor. So first, I wanna tell you one of the interesting things about this inscription. This inscription is important for a couple of reasons, but the major reason is this. I wanna take you back to a phenomenon not too long ago, but the Da Vinci Code. Now the Da Vinci Code is fiction, but it portrayed itself as, yeah, kind of fiction, but no, kind of real. There's a, there is a long conspiracy that has been kept from you, and one of the things that's been kept from you is, these are characters in the book. Now scholars won't say this, but honestly, there are a lot of people today that'll say something to you like, Jesus never claimed to be God. And in fact, early Christians didn't think Jesus was God. Why do they think that? This says, uh, for example, one of the characters says, hold on, you're saying Jesus' divinity came from a vote? Talking about the Council of Nicaea in 325, where Constantine gets everybody together and says, let's get on the same page let's vote and make Jesus a God, that Christians now believe Jesus is God. So you will see, meet people that say, Jesus didn't say he was God, his early believers didn't think he was the son of God. That came from a vote 300 years later. And that's what this book kind of portrays. So the expert in the book says, remember in those days there were gods everywhere. By infusing Jesus with divine magic, in other words, making up the miracles, making him capable of miracles and his own resurrection, Constantine turned him into a god in the human world. He basically locked all the other gods out. In other words, this theory says that, that early Christians, there were many different Christianities and not all the Christians thought Jesus was God. This is still a popularly held idea and it's, uh, it really persists. So the idea of when Jesus' followers came to believe he was God is not a mystery to us. A very good argument that at least at the resurrection, but outside the Bible, this inscription is the oldest reference to Jesus as God. I've translated this here on the side. This is a woman's name, a keptus. Why is this here? It says the God-loving Akeptus, the devout Akeptus has offered the table. So this, she paid for, I'm gonna go back, this. She underwrote the creation of this table. Right now you just see the pedestal, but I'll show you what it would have looked like. So this is an inscription thanking her for uh, providing the table, has offered the table to God Jesus Christ. Christ as a memorial. 
this piece of the inscription says God, Jesus Christ. This is the oldest, far older than the Council of Nicaea, isn't it? This is 100 years before the Council of Nicaea. So any argument that, oh, they just made Jesus God when Constantine became emperor, apparently not. You have Christians worshiping in 230 AD and their inscription says, Jesus Christ is God. Hugely important to validate what the Bible says about what Christians believed. So let me pause for a second and uh, take a question if you have some. Yes, can you tell us when the excavation occurred, <clears throat> when this was found? Um, the dig report that, when, when was this excavated? You know, I don't know the answer to that. It, went, it was in the latter part of the 20th century, not very long ago. The dig report that I read when it first came to my attention was 2005. In archeological terms, that's yesterday. Uh, but it takes a while for you to hear. Probably not that many of you have heard about this. It hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but it will. It is hugely significant. And this is one of the reasons that it's significant. Oldest Christian worship space ever found and the oldest outside the Bible attestation that Christians believe Jesus was God, that he was indeed the son of God. And so it, it really puts to rest some of the more popular doubts and misconceptions and kind of like, well, we don't have anything written that said Jesus was God except by, uh, you know, just books. And who knows when those books were written? Well, you know exactly when this was made and it was made far before the Council of Nicaea. So that's one of the ways in which this is significant. Okay, question. How do we know when it was made? Uh, that's a good question. So how do we know when it was made? Uh, the dating, it's a long story about how you would date something. This one's not that hard because there were coins found here. So coins found here, the fact that the sixth legion is here, uh, the strata, the pottery that's here. Uh, a lot of things go into this and into dating it but there's no disagreement about the dating of it. That's one of the reasons why when you first dig it up, it takes a while for this to become really popularized because wait a minute, there needs to be a more scientific approach to dating it. You know, you'll find places where uh, amateur archeologists would dig something up and go, you know what, I'll bet you that's the ancient biblical city of such and such. Who knows? But it takes years, sometimes decades, of research to, to put the clues together to figure out when this is dated. Obviously, biological material can be carbon dated. That'll come into effect when we talk about certain scrolls and things like that. But here, this is, there's not any doubt about the dating of this. There were a lot of things here that would let you date this with, with pretty reasonable accuracy. So, good question, though. Uh, in fact, by the way, okay, this is totally off the subject, and we may talk about this one too, but you may or may not be aware that it, when we've been going, taking people to Israel, we would go to the town of Bethsaida. You remember the fishing village, you know, from, okay, some, from some of the apostles. We've been to two different Bethsaidas. And so, in other words, they've unearthed villages and go, I'll bet you that's Bethsaida. No, apparently not, because years later you realize, no, it doesn't pan out. Uh, and I do think, though, that Bethsaida has now been found, and maybe we'll talk about that in this. But it, it takes a while, but this one, no, not a lot of, co no controversy about it. it was, this one is, is pretty solid dating, okay? Well, that's not all. That's not the only inscription here. So the God-loving Akeptus, a female patron, paid for uh, the table, the altar. So let's go to the next thing. I wanna talk to you about so that was here. This is a Keptus, good little girl baby name, if anybody's expecting. I wanna talk about this inscription right here. This is fascinating, completely unexpected. This long inscription says this, Gaonus, also known as Porphyrius, a centurion, our brother, has made the pavement at his own expense as an act of liberality. Brutius has carried out the work. Brutius, is, that's a Latin name. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's Roman. 
It just means he has a Latin name. And he is the artist. No offense, this is not a particularly good mosaic, as mosaics go. It's really important archeologically. You're not gonna put pictures of this on your wall. Brutius was not great at what he did, but he, it's important that he's remembered. His name is over here in the small letters in Greek. This is Brutius over here. Gaianus, which is a Latin name, but he's probably not a Roman, and that is his given name, which is very interesting. It's not his title. It's not his formal Roman name. It's sort of, let me give you the, the, the significance of this. So if you have somebody comes here, and I'm just gonna pick on the physicians, this could be anybody, but say it's Dr. You know, uh, Jill Smith is the person. When they come into church, you don't usually talk to them as Dr. Jill Smith. You know, some churches would be Sister Jill. Here it would just be Jill. What, you know what I'm trying to say? You kind of drop a lot of the pretenses when you come into your family. That is what this is. That's, if you were gonna have an inscription of this centurion's name on something formal, you wouldn't do it this way. This is very familiar. Like, and then the fact that it says our brother, he's a Christian. He's worshiping in this space. And he had enough money to pay for the materials and pay the artist to make this mosaic. And so here is an inscription to a Roman centurion who is a Christian who's worshiping in this space, not a stone's throw from the Roman camp. This is fascinating. It's not unprecedented, but in a time when being a Christian is illegal, very interesting that you get someone of the level of a centurion who would be, it's, think of it as kind of like an officer. Uh, I put together some pictures of, of uh, what you might think of as a centurion. This is actually from the second century AD. And this is a carving on a grave, a picture of the person buried, and he was a centurion. And so you can kind of see a lot about his armor. We learn a lot about how centurions uh, were uh, armored and what they wore. I mean, it wasn't the same for hundreds of years, but very similar. And so this is a picture of an actual centurion who lived in the 100s. Uh, this is an inscription, not from this site, but from elsewhere in Israel, that says that it's a plaque on the, on the fort that says this is a detachment of the 6th Legion Ferrata. And so they really did have detachments like this around the area. This is a picture from the Chosen. And uh, so I thought I'd throw something modern in there. This is how they've chosen to depict the centurion. And they've done a good job, by the way. It's, it's good history uh, in that story. So I wanted you to see that a centurion was, as you might expect, over a century, over a hundred. Century means a hundred. They weren't always over a hundred soldiers, but that's the idea. And a centurion was a very responsible position. In the New Testament, you will see centurions showing up like 10 times. I mean, it's very interesting that you have these Roman officers showing up in the New Testament story. Now, of course, there are two places that are very familiar to you. Uh, I wanna show you on the right, this is modern day Capernaum. This is a Jewish synagogue and it dates from the fourth century. Okay, so the 300s AD. This is a close up of the side and you see the limestone here, which is imported, very nice, uh, a very beautiful synagogue inside, very well taken care of. But this synagogue is built on top of an older synagogue because if, you, if you're a Jew and you've got a synagogue, you're not gonna turn it into a supermarket. It needs to be another synagogue. And so to build this nice big new one, they built it on top of this old one that was just black basalt, just native stone, not very fancy. This one dates to the first century. This one dates to Jesus' time. That foundation, the synagogue that was made of that black stone basalt was the one when Jesus was there. This one in the 300s was built on top of it out of uh, this synagogue was for it. That's where this story happened in Luke chapter seven. 
When he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, Jesus entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, and the servant was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to ask Jesus to come and heal his servant. And when the elders of the Jews came to Jesus, they pleaded with you, he is worthy to have you do this for him. He loves our nation. He is the one who built us our synagogue. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, that's obviously a biblical account and it's true. And here we have later in the early church era, another centurion who pays for the Christian worship space. I mean, the fact of validating these stories is huge because it's coming from an extra biblical source. It's coming from an archeological source. One more in the book of Acts, you're gonna see a centurion who's here in Caesarea and Peter is staying here at Joppa, uh, modern day uh, Tel Aviv right there. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. He was a centurion of what is known as the Italian cohort. A cohort is a portion of a, of a legion. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. That, by the way, is kind of a code word. So God-fearing Greeks, or someone who isn't Jewish who's called a God-fearer, was kind of a word that was specifically used for someone who didn't convert to being a Jew, meaning they didn't necessarily eat kosher, they weren't necessarily a convert and give up their life and become Jewish, but they did believe in the Jewish God and they tried to follow the Ten Commandments. In other words, they were a devout pagan person who believed that there was one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and who tried to follow the laws without actually becoming Jewish. So these are people that believed in the God of, uh, of the Jews. And so he prays, and I, I, only, I don't need to go through the rest of the story. One of the things that happened here is he, in a dream, said, you need to send for this guy named Peter. Peter gets a dream and says, you need to go see a guy named Cornelius. He goes there, and this is the first time when Peter goes into his house, which would be a bad thing to do if you were a Jew, a risky thing to do, but he goes in and the Holy Spirit comes on them. He preaches to them, and that's when Peter goes back and said, you know what, guys? It's not just Jews that can become Christians. Anyone can become a Christian. And so this was a turning point in the early church, but it involved a Roman officer, a Roman centurion. One of the interesting things about this centurion is he's probably foreigner. And what you see at this village are evidence of Jews, Samaritans, because it's up in the north, so there are a lot of Samaritans in that area. There would be Romans, but mostly Roman soldiers came from all over the empire and they were just enlisted. So you've got a melting pot of people. So Christianity, one of the interesting things to me about this is that Christianity very early on was multi-ethnic. It wasn't just for Jews, it wasn't just for Greeks. It was, the Roman army had conscripts from everywhere. So you get everybody in it. The second thing is, it's from all different socioeconomic classes, which you'll see in a moment, but it's also from different elements of society. I mean, if a Roman soldier becomes a Christian, when it's not legal to be Christian, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? That tells you about the power of Christianity in the early world. So, oldest Christian worship space, uh, the God, Jesus Christ, I mean, any one of these would make this a huge fine. But the fact that there's a centurion whose name is given who paid for the floor is such a biblical tie-in. This is fascinating. A couple more. The next inscription, so we've talked about Akeptus and the God Jesus Christ. We've talked about Gaianus, the centurion, but there is another interesting little inscription right over here, and that's what I want to show you next. This inscription says, remember Pramila and Syriaca and Dorothea, and moreover also Cresta. These are four women's names. 
and uh, they're not uh, Jewish names, but that doesn't mean they aren't Jews. It's just the name, you know, you would take on the names that were Greek names occasionally. Not often would you take on a Latin name if you didn't become a, Latin, a Roman citizen. But basically, you, you get this kind of melting pot of people, but here are four women who are mentioned as being benefactors. In other words, they were supporters. They were supporting this ministry, had probably donated money to be able for this space to be there for Christians to come together. And the, the thing that I think is significant about this, I mean, as you can tell, this find is just packed with information and all of it ties in with the New Testament. The fact that Christians were worshiping in a particular way, which I'll show you in a moment, the fact that they believed Jesus was indeed the Son of God, the fact that even a Roman centurion would become a Christian, and the fact that women were instrumental in the early church. You're gonna see that all through the book of Acts, but I just wanted to point out a few places where you will see this in the Gospels. So this is from Luke, Matthew, and another passage from Luke. So soon afterwards, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news to the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him, 12 chosen uh, disciples. He had a lot of disciples. These women are disciples, but he had 12 chosen he was gonna give a special commission to. And also some of the women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager, Joanna is, you know, upper class because her husband was kind of the chief operating officer for Herod. This is a big deal. She's a Christian. Uh, and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. In other words, they were supporters, but not just financial supporters, they were believers and they went as well. So when Jesus went, it wasn't just the 12 with him. He had a, a group of people with him. Uh, this is at Jesus' crucifixion. So in his ministry, you see women. At his crucifixion, when the centurion and those were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, that's one of the 10 times in the New Testament centurions show up. He saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance. Now, I don't want to get into this whole men versus women thing, but all I want to say is, where are the rest of the disciples? They're not there. Just John and the women. That's all I'm going to say about that. So, there were many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus all the way from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Mary uh, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, at his resurrection... But on the first day of the week, Sunday morning at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they'd prepared, and they found the stone rolled away. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the man said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the other 11, the disciples and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. So my point here is not to get into the whole egalitarian, complementarian, role of women in the church thing, that's another topic for another time. What I want to say is, is it has been, has been and still is a tradition that Christianity, for all of the claims against it, is not a, quote, patriarchal type of thing. You see early, early on, women doing things in Christianity that they were not permitted to do elsewhere. And you see a much more of a mixing in the church, in the early church of, the, of women and men's involvement, spiritual equals before God. And you, uh, you see women patrons of the church, you see women doing all kinds of the backbone kinds of things in the church. And the interesting thing about this inscription is that that 
continued into the third century after the church in such a significant way that you actually get an inscription saying, remember these women who were also instrumental in this congregation. So if you just think about what this one find has, I mean, I'll just repeat it again. The oldest Christian worship place ever found, the oldest reference outside the Bible that uh, Jesus is God. You get a Roman centurion who is a brother, who is a Christian, who has paid for this space, and you get uh, these women who are acknowledged as patrons of, I hate to call it a church, because it's not really a church building in the sense that we understand a church, it's a Christian worship space. Very early, before you could start designing churches, you know what I mean, with a kid's area and all this kind of stuff, you know, official church architecture. That's not gonna come till the fourth century, over 100 years later. But this is what an early Christian worship space would look like. And you didn't need much in an early Christian worship space for it to happen. So you can begin to see some of the significance of this. And at the idea that they were worshiping here in this quietly, nevertheless, somewhat openly, literally in the face of a Roman detachment there. So this centurion would likely have been the officer in charge, and it's extremely likely that some of the soldiers would also have been Christians at the time. Okay? All right, one more thing. To me, the most important thing but before I do that, let me see, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, what is the incentive in modern day Israel for a Jewish state to allow excavation where the discoveries are Christian artifacts? That is a good question. So why would the Israel Antiquities Authority, who oversees excavations, they don't do all the excavations, but they oversee the excavations, why would they excavate here? Well, the way excavations work, broadly speaking, is the Israel, it's not like Israel has a line item and Israel Antiquity Authority, they do uh, indeed hire a number of archeologists. And it is, you do have to have an Israeli Antiquities Authority archeologist involved in any dig that you do there, right? But they don't necessarily do the digging and they don't pay for the digging. Almost all of these digs are done, donations, from uh, Christian organizations around the world or maybe Jewish organizations around the world. Christian organizations fund digs for Jewish sites, Old, Old Testament sites, and we're gonna look at some of those. But here, this wouldn't necessarily be high on the Israel Antiquities Authority list if they had to fund it, but there were American Christian funders who saw the potential of this site, that it's probably in the New Testament era, and funded this dig. A lot of universities will send students over to Israel in the summer to work on the digs. Most of the excavation happens in the summer because you've got manpower, labor. Uh, you can sign up, by the way. If you just look on the website, you could sign up to go dig all summer if you want to. Uh, that's not my idea of a vacation, but it's important and interesting stuff. You never know what you might find. So this was funded by Christians uh, organizations and uh, one of the interesting things about it is this isn't something that's going to go into the Jerusalem Museum, the Israel Museum, because it's a Christian artifact. In fact, this is currently being dug out and it's going to be coming to the United States for display first. Where? Oh, Museum of the Bible is where this will show up later this year. Can you talk a little bit about how they find the places to dig? Like in this case, it was an expansion of the prison, I believe. Yes, I forgot to mention that. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm gonna go back and I'm just gonna show you how we knew that they were digging over here. That is a prison, right? That is a functioning prison right behind him. This, this uh, mosaic was in the prison. And so they were digging for another reason, and this happens a lot in Israel. So they start digging to build another building, and all of a sudden you go, oops, that looks like antiquities. So you have to stop. Trust me, 
Being a road developer in Israel has got to be one of the hardest jobs ever. You start to build a road, as soon as you hit something that looks like, oh my gosh, those are stones, those are clearly ancient, don't know how old they are, but we got to stop. Israel Antiquities Authority comes out and says, yep, that's right, got to reroute your road. Well, they came out here and they said, yeah, you're not building a new building. In fact, they're going to relocate this whole prison so, they, uh, so that if they want to, they can continue uh, digging in this area. Uh, but that prison is going to be relocated. You can see that tower right there from Megiddo. And so every year we were there, I'm like, what are they digging over there at Megiddo? Yeah, they're digging in the prison and we don't know what it is. Well, now you know what it is and it's a pretty significant find. Sometimes things like this you find by accident. Some places you kind of get an idea from the Bible of where geographically this was and then you go look and there are telltale signs uh, like, for example, Megiddo. Megiddo, before it was ever excavated, was a hill. And you go, that would be a great place to build a city right at the end of Jezreel. I wonder if that's Megiddo. And you start excavating. You just cut some trenches and you start to excavate and you realize, oh yeah, there are cities here. Then you start to dig and you realize, oh my goodness, there are cities here from many, many, many centuries. So sometimes it's informed digging Sometimes you just stumble onto something. So that's a great question. So back to, to me, the most important thing, and, and I, I say this because it's imp most important to me as a Christian. Everything we've talked about is significant to validate the Bible, that women had huge involvement, that Roman centurions, it's not crazy. The Bible wasn't making up this thing about a Roman centurion becoming a Christian and helping to fund this that uh, you get the idea of the early Christians thought Jesus was indeed the son of God himself and even when it was illegal, they were worshiping. And so you get a lot of validation of the Bible. The most interesting thing to me is this. I, I'm showing you the artist's rendition here. So this is the base of an altar and it's basically a table that looks like that. And how do I know it's a table? There are, there are two words for altar in Greek. And one of the words is used for pagan altars, a bomos, which is oh, it's someplace you'd burn uh, animals, things like that. It's a pagan altar. The altar in Jerusalem, a Jewish altar, is a different Greek word. And then you'll see it used in the Gospels when Jesus says, uh, if you bring your gift before the altar and realize you have something against your brother, leave and do that, that word for altar is not this. And it's not the pagan word, it's a different word. This is not actually the word for altar. And it's translated well here. This is the word for dinner table. The God-loving Akeptus has offered and paid for or built this table to God Jesus Christ as a memorial. Why would the center of a Christian worship space, it's not a pulpit, it's not a baptismal font, right? It's a, the word for dinner table. It's a word for a table where you would eat. Well, you're ahead of me here. You already realize this. But it's hugely significant to me that obviously there was singing happening there. Obviously, there was praying happening in this space. There was probably, what we know from the New Testament, people reading, if they had scripture, they would be reading scripture. There were probably even people giving a little talk to the others, maybe sharing their testimony, like we do at Celebrate Recovery so well, maybe giving a lesson you know, off of this. So it was, it was a lot less formal than what we do now, a lot less structured. But what's at the center of it? Communion. That's what that table is for. And it really represents the idea of what the Christian community fundamentally was and is. I wanna take you back to Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four. So this is early Christians in the 30s AD. I mean, right after the resurrection. So all these people become Christians, right? And in Acts two and in Acts four it says, and these people with such a tight knit community, they acted like they were literally brothers and sisters. Anybody who had needs, someone else would give them food. Somebody needed clothes, one of the other Christians would give them clothes. Just like you would do with a brother, sister, father, mother, 
kind of a situation. And all of the people saw that. That was part of the appeal of Christianity. Part of it was because it was true, but when they lived out Christianity, what they lived it out is, is in a community of believers who overcame their ethnic differences, their language differences, their social status differences, the fact that one of them was a centurion in the Roman army and one of them was a tax collector. The gospel overcame this and they all became followers of Jesus Christ. And when you read Acts 2 and Acts 4, it's all about this living community of people living out their faith. The sign of that is table fellowship. It also specifically says in the book of Acts that they broke bread together regularly in each other's homes. They had hospitality, they were together. And we also know that from the book of Acts when they came together, they celebrated the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist or communion, those are all three words mean the same thing. We do it today in kind of a formalized way with a little cup of wine or juice and, a, and cracker. That's a celebration. They did it a little differently, a little more like a meal where they would break the bread and they would drink, they would literally all drink. But bottom line is communion was the center geographically of this worship space. And communion, as you know, is done for a particular reason, and it's done to celebrate and remember what? What Jesus did, how he freed us from the cross and the resurrection. That, to me, is fascinating that the word they use for this is not an altar. It's not where you make a sacrifice. It's a table where you partake of the blood and body of a sacrifice that was made for you. This is hugely different. You read it in the New Testament, now you see it dug out of the ground. And to me, that is hugely powerful, is that what we do in worship and the centrality of the sacrifice that was made for us is the same that Christians have been doing all through the centuries and ties it all the way back to the very earliest disciples. So for all the archeological pieces of this, which are hugely significant, spiritually, this is the one that really hit me the most. Question. Okay, um, curious to know if these sites have been affected by the war in Israel. Uh, good question. Uh, this site has not been affected by the war. It's not far enough north, in fact, there are uh, some folks from Museum of the Bible there this week uh, supervising as this mosaic is taken out of the ground intact. So good question, but this is not uh, far enough to the north to have been affected or e evacuated by, uh, because of the Hezbollah attacks. So are there still digs happening actively in Israel currently? There, there are still digs happening in a lot of places in Israel. In fact, life is going on in Israel. Um, if you can get there, you can go there. Yeah, but I mean, there's, there you could go to places. Now, the, one of the reasons that I don't wanna go to Israel with a group until we're scheduled for February of next year is because they've evacuated a strip in the north up near the border with Lebanon because of the rocket fire and Hezbollah. Well, there are sites up there that we like to see. So there's nothing happening there. We never go anywhere near Gaza. That's a crazy place at the best of times. So that is happening there. But Israel is a country that has to get back to life. I mean, even in the midst of a war. So yes, there are still digs happening over there. How is this being moved to the USA? Uh, I do not actually know the logistics of that. However, we are making a documentary about it and you will be able to see how in the world did you move that to the United States? And uh, so we're gonna document that process as well. And you'll be able to see that uh, closer to the fourth quarter of this year, I think. How does the table in this building compare to a bima in a synagogue where the rabbis read from the center table or podium? Uh, that's a good question. So the uh, place where they would read, it was also table-like, but you should think about it, its use was much more that of a podium. It wasn't an altar, and it wasn't really a table. 
It had a different name, which she just said. And uh, roughly speaking, think of that as like, that's the podium. This is the dinner table. And it, it's just very different words and you can tell that they're different uses. That's a good question. Why is it being removed? Why is it being removed? Because we want you to see it. And we don't want you to have to go all the way there to the prison to see it. Now, in all seriousness, uh, it, it's not uncommon to make an arrangement with the Israel Antiquities Authority for antiquities to be on loan. Uh, I, I'll speak about the Museum of the Bible, but this is true for the British Museum and, and a lot of museums is the Israel Antiquity Authority has an exhibit there now that's there for two years, I think. And so they would give it on loan and of course you would pay them and you would move the artifacts there and you would put up a display because that's what museums do and the idea is to get this out. And so the folks that uh, funded this dig have also funded, the, uh, said to the IAA, will you bring it here? It's not just gonna come to the Museum of the Bible. I think it's also slated to go to some other major museums. And so this is something that's very commonly done is uh, loaning artifacts and museums share artifacts so that more people can see it. Is there any evidence of a potluck on that table? <laughs> I do think they found an ossified green bean casserole. Uh, it's a, some, what, some leftover green bean casserole. Well, I, guys, I hope you're as excited about this as I am, but why am I telling you this? This is a major find, but what I wanna point out to you is, and I will tell you if we find things that aren't favorable to the Bible. Let's let the truth go where it is, but this is unbelievable in every one of these respects. You know, a Christian worship, even in, in when it's illegal, a centurion who's a Christian, the women who are patrons, the God Jesus Christ, a communion table at the center. I mean, the tie into the Bible is just so, uh, it just so affirms the biblical account. And as you dig things out of the ground, you, you just find that the stones themselves testify to the truth of the New Testament. Next time though, I wanna talk about another really common objection to Christianity. This one, one of the objections is, the Christians didn't think Jesus was God until Constantine. Well, that's not viable anymore as of the finding of this. Another objection has been, the Bible you're reading today doesn't look very much like the Bible when it was first written down. And so next time, I wanna answer this question. Archaeologically, how certain can we be that the Bible that you read is true to the original? That's what we'll talk about next time. Thank you, guys.